It's been just over a century since man first achieved powered flight. While the public now enjoys taking planes to almost anywhere in the world, the tourism industry is setting its sights on the next frontier, sending private individuals to space. At the moment, this is just the preserve of the rich and interested. But what we want to find out is whether or not space could soon become a place that we're all saving up to visit. And for budding astronauts without millions of dollars to spare, is there a more affordable space-like experience to be had in the meantime? Sort of floating around in a wet dream. We've come to Washington DC to meet the president of a company called Space Adventures. What they are is basically a glorified travel agency selling package holidays to space to very rich people. If you've got unlimited amounts of money, what sort of a space holiday can you go on at the moment? Ben, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. This is Space Adventures headquarters here just outside Washington DC. This is the uh, Orlan spacesuit, and if you're up on the International Space Station and you wanted to go out on a spacewalk, uh, this is the spacesuit that you'd wear. None of our clients have done the spacewalk yet, but uh, a lot of them have been interested in it. And what it really is, is a, a self-contained spacecraft. It has all the equipment in the back for life support. People get claustrophobic in this thing. Is that one of the things that you need to overcome? Uh, you, you need to get comfortable inside it. What you basically do, if you step in here, mm -hmm. I, would, I would only do one arm, to be honest, because it's a little, because you're so broad-shouldered. Yeah, it feels great inside here. Yeah, uh -huh. this astronaut had small thumbs, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what would you be able to sell me? At the moment, we can send you as far as the moon. Uh, we can't land on the moon, but what we will do is send around the far side come to within about 100 kilometers of the moon's surface and then come back again. And how much would that cost me? It would cost $150 million. So if I didn't have $150 million, mm -hmm. what's the next step down that I could experience? Uh, you can live in space on board the International Space Station. You can live there for up to two weeks. And how much would that cost? We could arrange a flight for around $50 million. $50 million. Yeah. And for everyday people mm -hmm. who have grown up with a passion and a desire to go to space. What's the closest thing to space that they could experience at the moment for a sum of money that they could potentially save up for? So they could experience a zero G flight where you can get a few moments of, uh, of weightlessness. I think it totals about seven or eight minutes over the course of a flight. And you can experience what it is like to float in space as if you are an astronaut. Are you working towards democratizing this experience in any way? Yes, I think what we're doing is already democratizing the experience. There are 550 people who have ever flown to space in the last 50 years. Seven of those are private individuals, and that's not an insignificant contribution. As far as making space something that everyday people can visit, that's it's another decade or so away. The zero gravity flight is something that we want to try out. Is that worth the money for me? It's a tremendous experience, something that you'll remember for a long, long time afterwards. And in fact, we have a flight uh, in, in Florida. And if you want to join that, you're absolutely more than welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> really good. Very good. Maybe it's my lack of imagination, but I find it hard to believe that in 30 years' time, we're all going to be going on holiday to space. For me, it's something that exists in films, and in science classes and sort of through a telescope. And talking to Tom, I wasn't that convinced that he'd given the democratization of space travel that much thought. But I left thinking, well, who are these people that are willing to spend that kind of money on a trip to space? Which is why we're going to New York to meet a guy called Richard Garriott, because he's one of the seven people that Space Adventures have managed to sell one of these packages to. Richard Garriott made his millions from designing fantasy computer games, 
and like any respectable fantasist, I'd been told his house was like a museum to the weird and wonderful. Welcome, welcome. Richard, Come on in. how are you doing? The house is full of, uh, of unusual uh, creations. I'm really into swords and crossbows and armor. Intermixed amongst that are some things you might consider a bit macabre. These are vampire hunting kits, and these are authentic shrunken human heads. Richard is the only second generation astronaut in America. His dad flew for NASA, and traveling to space has been his lifelong dream. Is this your sort of dedicated space corner? No, there's more than one dedicated space corner in this house. These are the big artifacts. The vehicle that I went up on was a Russian Soyuz. When you're on board that vehicle, you still wear uh, a protective garment on the inside just in case there is a depressurization event in the capsule. When you go through the launch process, you're in the spacesuit for 10, 12, 14 hours or so. And so most people within that period of time have gone to the bathroom at least once. And so in the spacesuit, you actually wear a diaper. This little seat here that's next to me, normally for launch and re-entry, it's, it's really reclined back like this. And the window's inside out, that's actually what you see on the inside. Uh -huh. So this distance, you know, this is maybe what, four inches? Four inches outside of your shoulder during re-entry, you're, you're hitting the atmosphere so fast at 17,000 miles an hour that you're creating a plasma that is hotter than the surface of the sun. So right here, it is hotter than the surface of the sun, and it's only this far away from your body. And so uh, uh, that is a, uh, shall we say, a surreal moment. My desire was always to go to space. You know, when, when I was young, my father was an astronaut, as you obviously know. My right-hand neighbor was Joe Engel, another astronaut. My left-hand neighbor, Hoot Gibson, another ast astronaut. And so I grew up just believing that Travel in space was sort of the manifest destiny of everyone. And it was a NASA doctor who told me one year when I was about 13 that I needed glasses. And oh, by the way, that disqualifies you from being a NASA astronaut. And I was crushed. I just got kicked out of the club that my father, my neighbors, all, everyone in my neighborhood was a member of. And this one guy just nonchalantly just kind of kicked me out. That's when I said, okay, that's wrong. That, that guy can't be the gatekeeper to space. If I can't go by that person's rules, I'm gonna have to go help make my own rules. And that's why I've been devoted to the commercialization of access to space for the, you know, the rest of my life. And how much exactly did you pay? $30 million. Wow. And when I did that, I was ha very happy to do it. However, then another interesting thing happened, which is the first year of your training is medical pre-qualification. So you've already paid millions of dollars. You're never getting it back. And I get a phone call from the medical team that says, Richard, you have a disqualifying medical condition. You're ineligible to fly. I'm like, how can this happen? And what they told me was, is they said, a normal human liver has six lobes, and a lobe has one artery that feeds it and one vein that drains it. You are missing a vein. Two hours later, I get a call back, and I say, Richard, we think we can fix it. So within two or three days, we have to take you to a hospital where they're gonna remove that lobe of your liver. And that's what they did. And so this is my memento. This is the life-threatening surgery I had to go through to re-qualify. And the doctor, by the way, is going like, Richard, you know, as a medical professional, I have to tell you, I should, you, you shouldn't go through the surgery because it's life-threatening and you don't need it. You're well, a perfectly a healthy I mean, person. People would say that's a kind of almost an unhealthy obsession with going to space at that point. You could, but I wasn't got a little thing like, you know, the possibility of death, you know, get in the way. Do you think going to space has changed you? Absolutely. My conception of the scale of the Earth went from this ambiguous, hard to, you know, global giant thing to suddenly being finite and small. The feeling of weightlessness and the beauty of the view out the window is so compelling uh, that uh, I think it would be very difficult to not want to stay forever. After meeting Richard, he's clearly got such a passion for the universe. The fact that he's been able to fulfill his dream of going to space is amazing, really. And now that space travel has been taken out of the hands of government organizations and put into the hands of private individuals, the sort of innovation that creative people like Richard will bring to the space industry is really exciting. 
And what I wonder is whether or not people like him will have been written into the history books as pioneers who have made commercial space travel for everyone else possible. On a packed plane to Florida, the idea that space could be the final destination still seemed like a fantasy. Perhaps this had changed once I'd got a taste for weightlessness on Earth, but would it be worth the $5,000 ticket? So it's about quarter to nine in the morning. We're in a car park outside an airport hotel in Tampa. We're here because we're about to be inducted into the zero gravity experience. So what I've heard about this is that it's one of the closest experiences you can have of space while still kind of essentially on it's, Earth. It's Is the that only, true? it's absolutely, it's the only way to experience weightlessness here on Earth without going to space. So it will be little short bursts of it, but it's exactly the same sensation that you will have if you go to space. You're going to be free falling inside the aircraft. So the plane is going to fly at about a 45 degree angle up and then about a 45 degree angle down. So when you're Going up, you're gonna feel about 1.8 times your body weight, 1.8 Gs. And then right as you push over the top, that's when you become weightless. So here's your flight suit. What most people notice is <laughs> this is gonna be upside down. Okay. And it's an old NASA tradition. Huh? We're gonna keep it upside down until you finish your first flight and then we're gonna turn it right side up. Thank you very much. Thank you. I shall see you, you in zero gravity. I feel like a big fake astronaut, but it feels great. <laughs> the sensation that you are going to feel today aboard G-Force One is not a simulation. It's the real deal. What they say is that this is part of training to become a space tourist. Is that something that you'd want to do as well? Absolutely. In the future, in a couple of years, I'm hoping it's going to take off the ground, and I want to be one of the first people to go up there, look above the Earth, look down on Earth, and get to experience weightlessness all again. Why? why? Why do you think this is the kind of thing that people want to do? Because I think it's the future. I mean, I think in the future, we're going to be having a lot of flights to the moon, maybe even Mars. And it, we've always been tethered bound to this Earth. And I think man just wants to get up and explore the heavens. After takeoff, we climbed to 30,000 feet and got positioned in the padded area of the modified Boeing 747. How are you feeling now? Still a little nervous. Still a bit nervous. Don't be nervous, Tim. <laughs> the first dives eased us in by simulating Martian gravity, which is 62% lower than the pull on Earth. Naturally, the slightest shunt in one direction sent you flying in the other. When zero gravity came, it felt as if my entire body had been filled with helium. And like giddy children, all of us were overcome with hysterics. <laughs> Out of nowhere, this pressure just comes, and you're just being sucked into the floor. Nothing that you can do about it. Without blood rushing to your head and the fluid ducts in your ears keeping you balanced, this upside down weightless reality was oddly intuitive. Flying 
floating around in a wet dream. <laughs> Trying to hold down a bit of stick, to be honest. The nausea comes in from the, the constant sort of up and down, having pressure put on your body and then being sort of released. It's kind of like someone squeezing your stomach. So if space is a kind of permanent weightlessness, then you can imagine that that, that would actually be much nicer than what we've just experienced. First, I didn't know what to expect. And the next thing you knew, gravity was off, I was floating. And from that point on, it was, I could do anything. It was no restrictions, no boundaries. If everyone could just give it a try, and it opens up a whole new world. Does this feel like you're a step closer to space? It does. It feels like you're not confined by gravity, you're not confined by like, the laws of physics. You could just do what you want to do. You're a space That's, ambassador now. We are, we both are, yes. Oh. Let's hug. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you are now officially a zero G member. And all. Zero G member. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations for your flight and everything. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I guess the zero G group are kind of a bit like the space equivalent of crack dealers. They'll give a little taste of weightlessness to a few people and then they'll go off and tell all their friends how good it is and then people get a bit addicted. But I do feel like I've just had some sort of near space experience and I feel really privileged to have done that. Space tourism could be seen as a bit of a fad for the wealthy in this transitional period until these private companies innovate to the point where the price of leaving the atmosphere isn't so astronomical. By the end of my trip, it didn't seem so ridiculous to imagine a mass market version of space travel. Would I want to go to space on holiday? I might just prefer to go camping somewhere. But when it gets all Star Trek, perhaps I'll change my mind. <laughs>